Hello students, now we will see attitude and behavior change principles wherein we will see appeals by physicians, mass media appeals, promoting health in schools and workplace and self-help groups. Health information is the first important component and a key ingredient in any attempt to bring about health behavior. People will not usually stop engaging in unhealthy behaviors unless they learn that these are important for preserving health. Until the early 1960s, for example, cigarette smoking was generally believed to be safe. Then reports in the scientific literature made their way into the popular press and other media and the word was out that smoking was indeed very dangerous. And these days we are learning more and more about the dangers of overexposure to the sun and the increased risk of skin cancer. We are also finding out that certain diets which are high in saturated fats and low in fiber may lead to heart disease and certain cancers. Of course, that does not mean that health messages affect everyone equally. In one Harris survey done by Fisher and Rost in 1986, health professionals ranked not smoking as the number one health protective action, whereas the public ranked it 10th. The ideal health message is one that changes a person's health behavior for the better. For example, a message about the importance of monthly breast self-examination would present the fact to a woman about the importance of conducting the examination and teach her how to do it. And health messages that are individualized in the person's own vocabulary, targeting their individual values, etc. are most effective. But even with a well-designed message, there is still a big step to a regularly executed health behavior. And this step is made considerably more difficult when an individual faces an overwhelming number of health messages, particularly if some of these messages are contradictory in nature or contradicting one another. And people receive these health messages through various means, from their physician, through mass media, from schools and workplaces, and from the self-help groups. One potential important source of health information is an individual's physician. In the patient-physician interaction, the physician can suggest specific behavioral steps that are needed to achieve the intended health goal. In a meta-analysis that has studied 127 studies and has presented the result in an article titled Physician Communication and Patient Adherence to Treatment that which has been published in the journal Medical Care in 2009, it has been found by the researchers that patients of physicians who communicate well have a 19% higher rate of adherence and some studies have estimated that 25 to 50% of patients don't follow doctor's orders and non-adherence isn't just about medications of course but can include a failure to carry out other areas of practices and to keep medical appointments. Patients often leave the doctor either not knowing with what they have been told or disagreeing with it. There are many reasons but communication is the key. Partly that means that ensuring patients understanding of their illness and the risk or rewards of treatment is essential. But promoting adherence often requires a deeper understanding, a grasp of the patient's beliefs, values, meanings and goals. Physicians do play a unique and important role in assisting patients to carry out healthy behaviors. And another factor is the patient physician concordance, the extent to which patients and their providers agree on whether, when and how a medication should be taken. Hence, adherence requires the patient to believe that there is a benefit to the medicine being prescribed and the prescriber's role is to gain trust from the patient, understand the patient's belief system, find a way to treat within the system and interactively obtain agreement from the patient on how and when to take prescribed medication and follow other healthy behaviors. Building trust and developing skills for successful provider-patient communication demand time, effort, knowledge, and practice. Mass media appeals. Mass media campaigns are used to expose high proportion of populations to health promotion messages using the media as an educational tool. Mass media campaigns are favorable because they are capable of communicating information and creating awareness and affecting a large number of population.
mass media interventions can produce positive health changes on a grand scale by enforcing positive health behaviors among individuals. And mass media campaigns can take a variety of forms in their efforts to communicate health messages. These include print media, television, radio broadcasts. In addition to digital and print media, there are a number of other creative avenues for disseminating health information like live theater, dramas or puppetry. And when designing an effective mass media campaign, it's important to consider how information will be interpreted by a particular audience. And adequate research is critical in avoiding cultural taboos and ensuring that the intended meaning is conveyed. And if we take radio, media organizations often use radio to broadcast health information because it's capable of reaching many people while maintaining a strong impact. Radio disseminated health messages have been found to be more cost effective than television as radio can reach people in their homes, cars or at work. And brief educational radio segments can be inserted between programs during prime time hours when the maximal number of people are tuned in. One American study has demonstrated that people who listen to the radio have a surprisingly accurate ability to recall details of broadcasts from months earlier. In this way, the study findings support the potential of radio to disseminate educational messages that significantly affect listeners. In developing countries, many rural villages do not have access to electricity or television, but battery operated radios are commonplace. Therefore, radio's ability to reach people in a diverse range of settings has made radio a prime medium for educational initiatives and various health topics has been addressed through radio program throughout the developing world. For instance, educational radio has been used in India for rural development, in Swaziland for health public, in Nicaragua for health education, in the Philippines for nutrition education, in Sri Lanka for family planning and health, in Trinidad and Tobago to promote awareness of proper breastfeeding practices. Like any other public health campaign, radio interventions must be carefully designed and implemented. Michael Neal outlines the following component necessary for a successful radio intervention in rural settings. He says that they should use experienced educators familiar with the local community and collaborate with community leaders. They should uh, model programs of existing work that has been successful in the region and use village intermediaries and respect established and accepted social structures. They could even encourage illiterate people to communicate their ideas and concerns through trusted villagers who can act as scribes if required. And as with any other mass media campaigns, it's crucial to identify the target audience in order to select appropriate production and transmission style. Now if we come to theatre, theatrical health education provides an active learning environment for audiences and encourages the exploration of social attitudes towards particular health issues. Theatrical performance can be used to model positive health behaviours or demonstrate the consequences of high risk activities. The live nature of the performances brings elements of interpersonal communication that help personalise the issue for viewers. And direct interaction with the audience member also enhances viewers' reception and internalization of the message. While there is great potential for the integration of theater and health education, there's also a corresponding need for trained community health educators. Effective training methods would involve skill sharing in which health educators and theater performance exchange knowledge and ideas. Though there are many examples of effective health education programs that use theatre, there is still a need for further evidence of demonstrated and consistent impact. The challenge remains to find evaluation procedures that are sensitive enough to measure the subtle shifts in viewers' attitudes. To date, health education through theatre has primarily been centred on HIV and AIDS, though it's important to expand and address other personal, social, community and health issues. Between the seams, for instance, is a play performed by adolescents and young adults at schools and community centers around the United States to spread awareness about HIV prevention while emphasizing tolerance and understanding of the illness. But there is further exploration of theater-based health programming in other areas of health 
would help to determine the ability of drama to examine diverse health themes. Puppetry could also be an effective means to convey health behaviors. Educators and healthcare providers are continually searching for innovative methods to promote health behaviors that are age appropriate and engaging. And puppetry has found to be one medium that meets these criteria, particularly for school age children. It's an imaginative educational and therapeutic method that can be used by trained school counselors, nurses, health educators, and elementary school teachers. And puppetry can also be used in workshops to introduce a variety of health topics, including nutrition and hygiene. For example, in Cambodia, where puppetry is an important part of the local culture, puppet shows are frequently used and are considered a highly effective means of communicating and teaching critical concepts to all ages. In Cambodian schools, a puppet show has been used to discuss diarrhea. In the performance, a young female puppet describes to students how she mixed salt, sugar and water to make a remedy for her younger brother. Similarly, other messages could be conveyed in a simple and effective way. One other effective medium could be analogies, which are used as a tool for forming mental constructs that simplify or render familiar a concept that the individual is attempting to understand. Analogies can be used to introduce new scientific concepts or change previously held beliefs. They can help individuals to overcome barriers to education by facilitating creative connections between the familiar concepts and the new ideas that are being presented. Media also sends inadvertent health messages that are not framed as health messages, but that nevertheless help to shape beliefs about health. The television and movie industry is particularly important here, as many movies and TV programs depict people living their lives and provide examples of habits and behaviors. But the important component of these mass media campaign is that, for the most part, these messages are getting through to us. Recent study has shown that television is the most frequent source of health-related information. With so many messages about health around us, it can be difficult to sort out what is worth believing and doing something about and what is not. We are bombarded with messages about dangers or risks to health, ranging from eating meat that is not cooked well to eating meat that has been charred from not drinking enough water to drinking too much caffeine. So when faced with an overwhelming number of precautions and pieces of advice, one might be tempted to simply give up and not worry about all the risks. But some risks are definitely greater than the others. And after years of research, some behaviors such as cigarette smoking continue to be confirmed as serious threats to dread. Hence, we can say that mass media has its own advantages and disadvantages. And if care is taken to convey the message in a creative yet informative way, it will be most effective as it could reach a large audience at the same time. Attitudes and behaviors habituated at a young age are likely to be more sustainable over time and thus may have greater impact than attempting to change the behavior of adults. Therefore, we need to influence children and youth to make healthy behavior choices. And how we can do that is through promoting health behavior in school. A healthy school community promotes a culture of wellness for its members, students, teachers, administrators, principals, staffs, parents, and community partners. These groups must work together to create an environment that supports healthy choices. A healthy school community should involve visible support for health from school administrators and other health champions, connections between the home, school and community, meaningful student involvement and careful planning to improve health priorities. And evidence-based action plan supports a safe and healthy school environment, partnerships with the broader community, quality health instructions and cross-curricular integration of health messages, and development and implementation of healthy school policies. Many terms have been used to describe the process for creating healthier schools, uh, such as health-promoting schools, comprehensive school health, coordinated school health, etc. Although these approaches have different names, they all aim to improve student health and educational success through the creation of healthy school communities. The five core components of healthy school communities are assess, plan, learn, 
champion and team sustainability whole school approach and health and education synergy and the five essential principles of health school communities include teaching and learning physical and school so physical and social environment evidence policy community partnerships and services the model for healthy school communities provides a foundation for school environments that support health of all members it draws from research on the health promoting schools and comprehensive school health approaches to identify key elements of healthy school communities as we have seen the five core components represents the key strategies that contribute to the success in building healthy communities are teaching and learning physical and social environment evidence policy and community partnership and services let us now see each of these five core components briefly teaching and learning involves effective implementation of high quality health and physical education curriculum as well as cross curricular links to health in all subjects areas and professional development for educators and learning opportunities for parents schools staff and community members are key parts of this component and physical and social environment involves improving the structural elements of a school community that influence student and staff health embedding wellness into culture of a school and establishing a positive social atmosphere for learning Evidence involves using findings from research and practice to gain buy-in for healthy school community initiatives and to determine the most effective ways for improving health in a particular school. And policy involves including goals, plans related to school health and wellness into school and implementing these policies. Community partnerships and services as the name suggests involves moving beyond the walls of the school to involve family and members of the broader community in supporting the student wellness using all of these components is the best way to improve school and student health this approach ensures that the health needs of the school community are taken care of in a holistic manner for example teaching students about the importance of healthy eating is more likely to change behavior if healthy foods are also sold in the cafeteria and staff and peers model healthy eating behaviors therefore the five essential principles are a series of factors that are necessary for the success of healthy school community initiatives and they include taking a whole school approach to improve health and wellness strong partnership and synergy between health and education sectors committed leadership from health champions and health teams use of assessment action plans and evaluation processes to guide school health initiatives and planning for sustainability Therefore with proper strategies and implementation of health programs at school children could be familiarized with health behaviors which are more likely to cause permanent positive change in their attitude and behavior An appropriate setting to target adult behavior change is their workplace The workplace along with the school hospital city island and marketplace has been established as one of the priority setting for health promotion in the 21st century the workplace directly influences the physical mental economic and social well-being of workers in turn the health of their families communities and society it offers an ideal setting and infrastructure to support the promotion of health of a large audience and the health of workers is also affected by non-work related factors but regrettably the concept that the workplace is an important arena for health campaigns of many kinds as well as basic occupational health and safety programs is not yet widely accepted in one country there were ill advised cuts in occupational health services to support aids prevention work due to a lack of comprehension that the workplace is a vital arena for aids prevention the concept of health promoting workplace is becoming increasingly relevant as more private and public organizations recognize that future success in a globalizing marketplace can only be achieved with a healthy qualified and motivated workforce a health promoting workplace can ensure a flexible and dynamic balance between customer expectations and organizational targets on one hand and employee skill and health needs on the other which can assist company and work organizations to compete in the marketplace for a nation the development of hpw will be a prerequisite for sustainable social and economic development the systematic process of building a workplace health promotion program emphasizes four main steps and they are assessment planning implementation and evaluation an assessment could be done to define employee health risks and concerns 
and describe the current health promotion activities, capacity and needs. And a planning process would help to develop the components of a workplace health programs including goal determination, selecting priority interventions and building an organizational infrastructure. And program implementation would involve all the steps needed to put health promotion strategies and interventions into place and making them available to employees. An evaluation would involve investigating the merit, worth and significance of these activities. And building a workplace health program should involve a coordinated, systematic and comprehensive approach. Workplace health promotion programs are more likely to be successful if occupational safety and health is considered in their design and execution. In fact, a growing body of evidence indicates that workplace-based interventions that take coordinated, planned or integrated approaches to reducing health threats to work to workers both in and out of work are more effective than traditional isolated programs. Integrating or coordinating occupational safety and health with health promotion may increase, promotion, uh, may increase program participation and effectiveness and may also benefit the broader context of work organization and environment. Let us now see how self-help groups helps in changing attitudes and beliefs towards health. There are a number of self-help groups which are voluntary groups formed by individuals affected by a particular disease or chronic condition for mutual caring. Early examples of such groups include Alcoholic Anonymous in the US and subsequently these were formed for many chronic illnesses including psychiatric disorders, diabetes, hypertension, different types of cancers and dementia, etc. In Germany, now the number of such groups has grown to about 60,000 by the year 1995. It's not easy to capture the value of self-help groups through empirical studies, but some researchers have partnered with self-help groups to find appropriate ways. And we can understand the effectiveness of self-help groups in bringing about a change in attitude and behavior from the following research which clearly demonstrates their value. A research conducted by University of Chicago Medical School has found that older men with diabetes, those who learn self-care techniques and participate in member-run support groups, two years later have reported to be less stressed and have gained more knowledge and rate the quality of their lives higher than those who didn't take such action. And we can even take Parents Anonymous, which is a group that seeks to break the vicious cycle of child abuse by halting parental abuse of children who would otherwise grow up to be abusive parents themselves. An independent national evaluation of Parents Anonymous conducted by Behavior Associates of Tuscan, Arizona revealed that of the 19% of group members who physically abuse their children on a daily basis before joining the group, after joining, only one person reported continuing such abuse and another study found that Parents Anonymous report that they gained insight into their reactions to the abuse which they typically experienced as children and that they learned new ways of expressing love and affection to their own children. The effectiveness of self-help groups has been studied and there is indication that self-help groups are associated with higher improvements compared to the controls. We have seen few examples of self-help groups that have been found to be effective whereas there are loads of them that are effective in changing attitude in bringing about a change in attitude and behavior and members find the group helpful because it provides them with information and coping strategies with professionals fail to provide and participation also helps patients to develop supportive social bonds with others who are experiencing similar problems so in this chapter, we have seen how effective physicians' appeals are in promoting good health, the advantages and disadvantages of various forms of mass media appeals, and how health could be promoted at school and workplaces, and the effectiveness of self-help groups. That's all about this chapter. Thank you.